Well, hello everybody, and uh, thank you for coming along to listen to this Bible talk today. We, uh, as Christadelphians, often uh, give Bible talks and lectures, and we talk about the good news of the Bible message. Well, we're going to look at one particular aspect of it this afternoon, and we're going to see how that there is a good news message regarding the world in which we live. Because, as the title says there, it says, Terrorism will end when Christ returns. Now, the good news is that the world in which we live today, with all of its violence and wickedness and corruption, will end, and in its place will become a, a new kingdom, which will be set up by the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns again to the earth. Now, the Bible has been very clear about this ever since it was written. We have prophecies in the New Testament which talk about the birth and the life of Jesus Christ and about his return, and we have prophecies in the New Testament which clearly indicate detail about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's going to do when he comes back and we're going to look at some of those briefly this afternoon. Now that reading we just had from uh, uh, from the Gospel of Luke, uh, 21st chapter, was where Jesus was speaking about some of the detail about future events to the time in which he was living when he had his mortal existence when he was doing his ministry some 2,000 or so years ago. He was talking about what the world would be like just before his return back to the earth. And specifically, he indicates for us what the concerns and fears would be of the people at that time. And in that 26th verse, he said, Men's hearts will be failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. But the 25th verse, the verse before, is the, one, is the one I want us to focus on because it says, There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. So amongst the governments of the peoples of the nations of the world, the nation states as we have them today, there's going to be this perplexity. Now that's not a word we use very often in everyday conversation. It's probably one that if we uh, used or we heard somebody use, we'd have to remind ourselves of what it meant. We'd have to look in the dictionary. It means, as far as the original Greek language is concerned, it means a situation in which there is no way out. The problems that there are in the world are going to be that bad, just before Christ returns again to the earth, that nobody in the world will have a solution that they can propose. There is no perceivable way to fix the problem or problems that will be there when Christ returns. And I suggest to you, friends, that terrorism, in its modernist form, is one of those problems to which there is no man-made solution. We're going to look at why that is, and we're then going to look at what the actual solution will be, the good news of the Bible message, talking about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, which will be a solution to this and all the other problems that we have in the world. The problem, essentially, with terrorism as we have it today, is now becoming ever more frequent, isn't it? It's mutated in the way it manifests itself. And uh, we've had, in Britain, a bad year. We've had uh, terrorist events. I think we had three in three months, something like that. Many dead, many injured, and dreadful and shocking scenes almost on a regular basis on our television screens and through the media. So we had an attack in London in June where somebody... Uh, hired a van and drove into a crowd of people and then other people after that were, were stabbed and the police intervened and people were shot and killed and many were injured and it was a dreadful, dreadful scene. That was June of this year. Previous to that there was an even more shocking one where children were actually attacked. Young people at a, at a pop concert in Manchester were attacked by an individual who decided that he would detonate an explosive device that he had in a backpack. So that uh, newspaper there records 19 dead. I can't remember what the final total was, but again, many lives lost and many lives devastated. And that was May of this year. And of course, going back to March again, again in London, an attack perceivably on British democracy at the House of Parliament, where again, somebody with a car drove it over people walking along on the bridge, going over the Thames, and then attacking the Houses of Parliament. So dreadful images but all of them linked by a common cause. It's the same cause that caused the 
dreadful attacks where many lives are lost in, in Paris in April of this year. Again, a couple of years ago, there was another dreadful attack in Paris at the offices of uh, a satirical uh, cartoon kind of uh, publication. Many lives lost there. Again, in November of 2015, there was another attack in Paris and in Nice, in the south of the country, on Bastille Day. So a, a big, important date in the, uh, the French calendar when uh, somebody decided to get a, a truck and drive into some large crowds in, in Nice. And actually, I, I actually went uh, on a bit of a holiday to, to Nice uh, about a year after that event, and there was still one of the parks on the seafront there, a, a, like a bandstand covered with flowers and placards and messages and uh, that, was, that was a year after the event so something which is upset and shocked France so it's, it's something which affects many nations and all of these are linked together because the question is why do we have terrorism now some people go oh it's religion it's religion which is the problem it's Islam which is the problem and then some people say well it's not all of them it's just some of them it's just the radical uh, few in the uh, Muslim world, it's just these jihadists and a lot of people arguing and debating over what the problem is. But essentially it's this, it's politics. Because if you look at the ideology behind the people who conduct these attacks, essentially they're political. And there's a lot of fear out there in the communities that, in which we live about uh, terrorism and, and what's causing it. But essentially it's a, it's a political ideology, a radicalised way of thinking, which is behind it all, because ISIS and the radical members of uh, Islam are intent on attacking uh, Western countries because they want to set up a global Islamic caliphate. In fact, they don't want to set up a new one, they actually want to recreate an old one. Because if you go back and look at your history books, you will notice from the year 750 or so to around the 1200s, there was the Abbasid uh, Caliphate. It, uh, it was initially uh, um, a kind of a government centred in Kufa, but in 762, uh, the Caliph, or the leader of that Caliphate, founded uh, this Islamic Caliphate in the city of Baghdad. And uh, this is actually set up by uh, one of Muhammad's youngest uncles, Al Abbas, which is where the Abbasid Caliphate takes its name, Al Abbas. Ibn Abd al Mutalib, if I said that correctly, uh, and he set up this first Muslim Islamic caliphate. And that's what the, the radicals of today are trying to recreate. They want to get rid of the corrupt Western world as they see it and replace it with this Abbasid, or recreate this Abbasid caliphate. And so, hence, that's the inspiration, that's the ideology behind much of, if not all of, the terrorism we have in the world. I mean, of course, in, in Britain we've had terrorism in the past for different causes and reasons, and elsewhere in the world that's the case also. Um, but uh, the, the main fear that people have today is, is to do with ISIS and radical Islam. So, that's the problem. We've seen the problem, we've heard about it, we've read about it, we've seen the terror that it's caused on people's faces, the lives it's damaged and affected. So, all of that is the world in which we live, and there's great argument and debate about, well, is this now just part of British life? Is this now just the regular, everyday part of life in the West? Have we just got to accept that this is the way it's going to be? And some people are furious that even people should accept that idea, that this is just the way it's going to be right now, something must be done. Well, we can look at what the Bible says, because the Bible makes very clear what is going to be the future for planet Earth, and it's good news. It's a kingdom which will fill the whole world. It's going to be a kingdom of peace and of righteousness, where things like terrorism and all the other man-made problems we have in this world today will be a thing of the past. So let's have a little look at that. So if the problem today of terrorism and all the others are caused by politics, then if that's the cause of the problem, then how can it also be the solution to the problem? How can politics solve the problem of its own making? How can electing people into office, hoping that they can solve the problem, actually wind up being the problem when it's politics, which is the problem. So, let's start then by going back into the Old Testament and looking at a prophecy uh, in Daniel, Daniel chapter 2. And in Daniel chapter 2, there is a vision 
that's been given to one of, if not the most powerful leader in the world at this time. It was given to a man called Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar was a man who dwelt in confidence. He had the largest kingdom on the face of the earth at the time. He had the largest army. He was powerful. He was rich. Didn't really have anybody to, to make him worry or be concerned. However, he's asleep in his bed one night and he does have something which concerns him. He has this vision. God makes him have this vision at night and it's terrifying. He wakes up petrified. He wakes up fearful, not understanding what the vision was and certainly not understanding what it meant. So, if we look at Daniel chapter 2, let's look at the first couple of verses for, for context. In the second year of the reign of <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled, we're told, and his sleep break from him. So this is some 2,600 or so years ago. Here he is, the most powerful king on the face of the earth at the time. A superpower in his own right, if you like. If you like. But he's terrified. The word there, trouble, means agitated. He's been shaken up. He's been made afraid by this vision, this image, this uh, thing that's happened to him while he's been asleep. So he's panicking, he's concerned, he calls the great and the good in verse 2, the sorcerers, the magicians, the astrologers, all the members of the royal court, the most intelligent in the land who serve him to come along and to give him an understanding and an interpretation. They can't do that, but then he hears what Daniel has to say, and Daniel reveals to him what actually was the vision and what it means. Verse 31 of, chapter, of Daniel chapter 2 says, Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image, this great image whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. The image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet, that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So he tells him what this vision is, he tells him that he sees this, this figure of a man made of all these different metals, and then he tells him that this, this uh, image was, was crushed and destroyed by this stone, this little stone. And then he explains to him what this, what this vision actually means. And in verse 44, he says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall consume, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So basically, Daniel's explained to the king that these different metals, these different parts of this image, all represent different kingdoms of the earth. And he explains to him that Nebuchadnezzar, thou art the head of gold in verse 32. So at the top there's this golden head which is representative of Babylon. And then after Babylon, the kingdom has fallen, another kingdom comes along, which is of inferior uh, strength. And it works its way down to the feast. But it's during the final phase, where we have the feet of part iron and part clay, that this little stone comes out from a mountain and destroys all of these kingdoms and sets up a new kingdom which will be different to all the others previously. The Babylonian kingdom was temporary, it lasted for a few years, ended. Then, after that, there was the Greek Empire and there was the Roman Empire. All these different empires in world history were there for a while, and then they went. They're all temporary. But this one is going to be different. This one is going to be a kingdom which will stand forever. So, this image which King Nebuchadnezzar saw was explained to him, 
by Daniel. Might have looked a bit like this. I mean, some pictures have the arms folded, some have them stretched out. It doesn't really matter, but it represents these different periods of human history and the empire powers, the big powers that we have there. So there's the Babylonian Empire, then the Persian, then the Greek, then the Roman. And we, friends, are living in the last phase. There is no phase after the one at the bottom. The nations are all strong or weak, part iron and part clay, which is what they are today. We don't have a sort of a, an empire which dominates most of the surface of the earth, do we? We live in this time of little nations, little powers, as it were. But it's during this phase of human history that this stone comes from nowhere and destroys it all, and it all gets blown away, and this new kingdom is set up. So that's the clear message from Daniel chapter 2, which is revealed two and a half thousand years ago. So, when this stone strikes the feet, it grinds all these nations away, and a new kingdom is set up. So, the Bible is clearly telling us here that God is going to intervene in the future and set up this new kingdom. And what will life be like in this new kingdom age? Well, if you go to Isaiah and chapter 2, it says this, speaking about somebody, it says, He shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So, someone's going to come back, he, it says there in Isaiah, chapter 2, and this individual is going to rule over the whole world, and will make sure that there is peace, and make sure that all the billions that are spent on defence, as it's called, weaponry, all of that is going to stop, and instead, people are going to recycle all that material and effort and energy, and instead make things to feed people. So everybody in the world will be fed. War will no longer be something studied in a scientific way, and war will no longer be practiced, because the world will be full of peace. There are numerous other prophecies that we need to look at, and another one of them is Zechariah in chapter 14, towards the end of our Old Testament, because Zechariah chapter 14 refers specifically to a city which is the central focus of uh, God's plan and purpose with, this, with the earth. In Zechariah chapter 14, it says in verse 1, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. So, Zechariah 14 is telling us that, that, that Jerusalem, at some point in the future, is going to be a centre point for world controversy. And nations are going to come against Jerusalem for battle. Now, if you look at the history of the world, you'll see that the capital of Israel, Jerusalem, is a controversial place. Because the, the uh, religion of Islam claims that that is a city that they should control and have, and they have a mosque there, and they believe that they should have control of Jerusalem. The Catholic Church, they say Jerusalem should be a city which is internationalised, so anybody can go and, and worship there. The Jews, they want Jerusalem as their capital city for Israel. So there are numerous different groups who want control and possession over one city at the same time. Can you see that, that might be a problem in some way? It's a very controversial place, but the Bible is telling us here that God is going to fight against those nations He's going to fight and defend Jerusalem because God has a plan for Jerusalem and indeed for the whole world. And it's God who is ultimately going to prevail. Let's go and look at verse 4 of Zechariah chapter 14. And his feet shall stand in that day, this day that God has appointed where he's going to intervene and, and defend Jerusalem and fight against the nations who've come against 
Jerusalem to destroy it. His feet shall stand in that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee like ye fled before the earthquake in the days of Isaiah, king of Judah. And the Lord, my God, shall come, and all the saints with thee. Now then, a couple of points there. So, somebody, he, his feet, is going to stand on the Mount of Olives. Now, if we look at uh, Acts in chapter 1, and verse 11, the Mount of Olives, we find out there, is where Jesus ascended to heaven from. And angels, as soon as he departed the earth to go to be with his Father in heaven, said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which ye've seen go into heaven, shall come back in like manner as as ye've seen him go. So Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives to heaven, and at some point in the future, say the angels, he's going to come back from heaven, back to the Mount of Olives. And that ties in here with Zechariah chapter 14. So clearly there's a connection here between the Lord Jesus and his physical return where his feet shall come back and stand upon the Mount of Olives. And look at what happens as soon as he does. The Mount splits in two. The Mount of Olives is going to divide in half. In, in, this is not the first time God has used his powers to divide the natural world. When he brought the Jews out of Egypt in ancient times when they were led out by Moses, the Red Sea was divided in two. And they walked out of Egypt as if it were on dry land. So here God is splitting the Mount of Olives in two. Now, for those of you who might be amateur seismologists and interested in physical geography, there's actually a geological fault line that runs right the way through Israel. It goes right the way through Jerusalem. And the experts in that field say that the amount of energy that you need to release to to cause a global earthquake if you do that at this site in Jerusalem it would be something which triggers off such a great earthquake all the world would be shaken there wouldn't be a two-story building left standing behind if an earthquake were to happen at that place well this is what exactly the Bible is saying God has deliberately built Jerusalem on this hot line and he's going to use it to advance his purpose when the Lord Jesus Christ returns So he's going to use natural forces and unleash massive natural forces at this time. It's quite fascinating to see how this is going to be done. So Zechariah also goes on to explain to us that the nations that have come to destroy Jerusalem are going to be uh, destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ and by those with him. Now if you look at verse 12 of Zechariah chapter 14, it says this, And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes. Their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbour. And his hand shall be, his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbour. So we're told here that this battle is going to be very unlike any previous ones, because it's God fighting on behalf of uh, His Son, the Lord Jesus, and on behalf of Jerusalem and the Jews. And it's not going to be a weapon fought with conventional warfare. God is going to use massive forces, God is going to defy physics. He's going to defy the way we understand the world in a scientific sense. This plague referred to here in these verses from 12 onwards seems to describe sort of flesh melting away. And this is the kind of thing that you see once nuclear energy has been released. Now when man detonates a nuclear weapon, everything within a blast radius is vaporized or destroyed. But God has the power and the ability to detonate more energy and force and power in this room and let still leave the wallpaper in this room intact. He has such control over such massive releases of energy when he's fighting in a war that 
Anything that he wants to be destroyed will be destroyed, and next to it, something which he wants to be preserved will be preserved. There's just unbelievable control and power available to him, for him to use. So these are remarkable things. Now, of course, we have a little verse in uh, the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, very briefly, we won't turn there for sake of time, but it talks about a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And this great battle between God, between the Lord Jesus Christ, against all those nations who've come against the Jews at Jerusalem to destroy them, is going to be this great battle called Armageddon. And after that, the Lord God is going to establish his great and glorious kingdom. So we're going to look at a few verses which describe a bit more detail about what's going to happen in the near future. So if you come with me to Acts into chapter 2, we'll find out a little bit more there also. Acts chapter 2. And we'll go in at verse 29, which says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Now, what's this verse telling us about the Lord Jesus Christ? It's telling us that even though Christ was going to die, because he promised one of his forefathers, David, that he would raise up one of his own descendants to sit on his throne as king over Israel, this prophecy was going to be something which God would make happen, and it would happen to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was going to die, but God was going to make him alive again, to bring him back to the earth, to fulfill a promise made to David previously. God is going to put Jesus Christ on the throne of Israel. He's going to reign as king over Israel. But not just Israel as it was in the past, or as we know it today, but over a new Israel, a greater Israel. We've seen in the Old Testament how that... Uh, there's going to be this great battle in the future, but after this great battle of Armageddon has taken place and the dreadful war has ended, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to raise, reign over a, a kingdom of peace and of righteousness. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 65 now. Isaiah chapter 65 explains for us in a bit more detail about what the future is going to be like in this kingdom age. Isaiah chapter 65, and we're going to start reading from verse 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. Be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of old days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, and the sinner being an hundred years old shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. And they shall not build and another inhabit, they shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labour in vain, nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call I will answer, and while thou yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion and the shall eat straw like the bullock. The dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt 
nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. So the way in which the world is set up and structured today is going to change. The natural world is going to change. In the kingdom age, when Christ comes back, everyone will work their own bit of land, they will work the land to feed themselves and their families, and they will consume what they produce. It won't be given for somebody else. They will be taking care of themselves. They will have their own vine, their own fig trees, we're told of their own scripture. So the idea of people going to the state to have things given to them to survive and to, to live, that will go. Everybody will be responsible for taking care of themselves with the portion of land that they're given. And the natural world is going to change as well. So in the natural world at the moment, we have animals that will quite happily eat other animals, but that is going to change as well. The wolf is going to live quite happily side by side with the lamb. The lion is going to live quite happily side by side with the bullock. It won't need to eat meat in order to survive. Death and destruction will be things of the past in the future age. Again, if we uh, go back to Micah chapter 4 in the first verse, we get a bit more detail there. It says, In the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the Lord, the mountain of the house of the Lord, shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above hills, and people shall flow unto it, and many nations shall come and say, Go and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among many people, and shall rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. So in the kingdom age, there'll be no appealing to the High Court, there'll be no appealing to the European Court of Human Rights. Jerusalem, Zion, will be the centre place of justice and of government for the whole world. And everybody will live side by side with each other in peace. So very briefly then, we've seen a few prophecies there which indicate for us what is going to be the future for the earth. It's a glorious and wonderful future. The Bible explains very clearly for us that the world in which we live with its problems and its violence and its terrorism is temporary. It will one day be a thing of the past. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to return to the earth and the earth which God made perfect in the first place is going to be restored to that perfect state. It's going to be a place of peace and of righteousness. And if we're prepared to read what the Bible has to say and believe what God has said in it and accept Jesus as a Saviour, then by God's grace, we have a glorious hope of being alive and living and part of that wonderful future kingdom of peace. And we'd be wise to find out how we can be a part of it. Thanks, Lucy.